with Associated Hexagon. And because of the importance of the following television programme, this will be transmitted at double the strength of a normal televisual programme. This will ensure that the entertainment factor has been heightened for your satisfaction and the highest possible standards are noted mentally. You may need to listen harder and give more attention to the following programme as it may include some flashing sounds. Hello, I'm Johnny and welcome to the Television Affair. Now, in the last few episodes, we've looked at satellite channels that you could get in the UK when satellite TV just first came around and the kind of thing that you might have had while satellite TV was becoming popular. Now, there were a heck ton of stations, but the ones that I wanted to cover in the other episodes were all either from the UK or specifically for a UK-speaking audience. However, many early satellite channels were pan-European and also countries that did have their own channels had to broadcast with the other countries watching it because that's how the system worked back then or at least that was the case until the turn of the century because that is when countries started launching their own satellite television services and mostly digital so it was around that time they managed to create their own local versions of stations such as MTV and Discovery and all that kind of stuff. Now I don't want to talk about digital right now because when I open that door it's a potential mess. Also initially when I I started doing the television affair I kind of didn't have a plan and now I do so what you're seeing is me getting my hot birds in a row before moving on to a different subject and that by the way was a satellite joke because it's about me getting my ducks in a row and ducks are birds and hot birds are satellites and they're all in a row it's not funny if I have to explain it anyway for the last bit in looking at satellite channels I'm going through of what I might have missed out on the last episode whether that's deliberately or by accident and I'll be looking into what channels you could have got in the UK if you had a bit of a switch around with your satellite box and we are talking mostly Europe here uh, whether that's something that you could pick up without fiddling too much or if at a stretch you went on holiday one day and you noticed that you saw some special BBC channel that you didn't know existed now I still won't get them all whether that's because I couldn't find it or whether it's because there wasn't information on the internet or I just forgot about it but there are situations where you can't find a lot of stuff about a channel whether that's on wikipedia or in chat rooms or a glance of a youtube video and it's just getting all of the information out of that as i could find uh, i will include channels that broadcast in other languages in this bit as long as you could pick them up in the uk and also i'm going to be skipping over some channels that we've already covered so here goes There were a few main satellites aimed across Europe that British broadcasters used to use. BSB used Marco Polo satellite until it got taken over by Sky and then they sold the satellite and it got renamed as Thor. Other than that, satellites that we got our channels from in the UK were floating around around 19 degrees or 13 degrees east. And you could get these without moving your satellite dish. These satellites were launched between 1983 and 1995 and they were all analog services. From around 1996 onwards, they were releasing digital channel satellites into the sky. Anyway, the satellites we're looking at today are Astra 19.2, Astra 1A, Astra 1B, Astra 1C and Astra 1D. And Utelsat F1, F2 and F4 and F5, but not F3 because that blew up at launch. Utelsat was also known as the ECS 1, 2, 4 and 5. Like I said, some of the information in this video is a bit patchy and I've tried to find the footage of whatever I can and also fill in the gaps. Good morning, welcome to the Parliamentary Channel. The Parliamentary Channel started in 1992 after United Artists Cable carried out some broadcasts following the events of the Houses of Parliament. Yesterday in the Commons went so well, a channel was launched following the latest stuff that was going on. This came about because MPs voted to allow cameras into the House. The music you can hear sounds a little bit more like it should be on Thomas the Tank Engine rather than in the Houses of Parliament. In 1998, the Parliamentary Channel was purchased by the BBC and it's now known as BBC Parliament. It's pretty much a fly on the wall of the House of Commons and over the years it's covered the battles and events such as Dennis Skinner's amazing comments. I still refer to him as Dodgy Dave. 
and the great times like when David Cameron did eight Jaeger bombs in a row and that time early on when Margaret Thatcher was there to snort worms and she did. Like I said, the information is patchy and uh, nobody else has uploaded those videos so unfortunately I can't find them. as a public service channel jointly operated by various stations across Austria, Germany and Switzerland. It was founded by a cooperative network and it began broadcasting in 1984. A fun fact about this station is that in 1990, during the German reunification, Deutsche Fernsehfunk, uh, which means German television broadcasting but sounds a bit more funkier, approached 3SAT to join its consortium and it did, but it left in 1992 because it ceased to exist in accordance with the German Unification Treaty. 3SAT still broadcasts now, but it has a few other organisations included, even though it was called 3SAT because of the three original companies. I have no idea how they pitched the dancing eye and eyeball, but there you go. ORF or ORF is an Austrian public broadcaster dating back to nearly a century ago as a radio broadcaster. Its services were used as naughty German propaganda in the bad old times when listening to enemy radio stations, Feinsenden, was against the law. After the war, ORF1 came to air in the 1950s and then to satellite in the 1980s and it launched ORF2 in the early 1960s. It's still running now. Next, we're off to Switzerland, and the good thing about the Swiss is their flag. It's a big plus. Now, SRG is an organisation of four broadcasters. This is because in Switzerland, they have four official languages, which makes things very interesting when it comes to broadcasting. So, firstly, we've got SRF, which is in German. In the past, SRF also used to be known as SFDRS or SF1. It's still broadcasting now with obviously some nice shinier logos. TSR was a French language station and it changed its name when Swiss Romance Television and Radio Services merged in 2010 and now it's called RTS. And these are all the stations that they have. No expense spared there on the orchestra hit. So RTSI was the Italian language service and it was named TSI1 and later joined by TSI2 and then they both renamed to RSI La1 and RSI La2. The last one is RTR which is the Romance language version and it doesn't have its own channel however it does have dedicated programs on the other stations. <laughs> Here's a kid station I mentioned before, but I didn't go into too much about it. It's called Minimax, and we didn't have it in the UK, but looking at the ident and listening to the music, this has gone down very well in this country. I was looking at some of the promos, and for some of the shows, I haven't seen them in years. Uh, they had stuff like the Adams Family cartoon and Super Ted. Now, its brand was used either across Europe as its own channel or as a strand on other channels from around 1995. It's owned by AMC Networks that bought it in 2000. It's been on air in Spain, which got replaced by Fox Kids in 1998. In Poland, but it got replaced by Zig Zap in 2004. But it's also been on in Hungary, Romania, Moldova, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Serbia, Slovenia and Bulgaria all at some point in the past. Oh, and Scandinavia. TV 
TV5 or TV Sank launched in January 1984. It was created by the French government along with a consortium of five European broadcasters, hence the five in TV5. It's now called TV Sank Monde, meaning TV5 World. It was one of the channels that the cable authority had actually given clearance to cable companies in the UK to broadcast, along with a couple of others that we'll be looking at today. And what I found during this research is the French really love their numbers, especially the fifth number, number five, um, because they seem to be really keen on being the fifth broadcaster. Now we've got TV5 here. Uh, the next one is not to be confused with TV5 or the channel that succeeded the one I'm about to tell you about. This is La Sank. <laughs> Le Sank was a French free-to-air TV station backed by Italian media mogul Silvio Berlusconi. Yes, that one. He would become the Italian Prime Minister at some point, but in the 1980s, he was in the TV business, and he got together with a guy called Jerome Sado, I think that's how you say his name, who was a French politician. Now, he created the station, and it was called The Five because it was the fifth French television channel. Critics accused them of wanting to create coca-cola tv silvio berlusconi's response then your television we are in the process of starting think it not that's called coca-cola television it is spaghetti television it would be Beaujolais champagne television on the saturday sorry what are you expecting some sort of like translator to do it the channel launched in 1986 and a lot of the shows that they aired had already been on television in France and they all come from the 60s and 70s and a bit of the 80s and also the US such as Different Strokes, Happy Days, Mission Impossible, Dukes of Hazard, Star Trek, that sort of stuff. It was all French dubbed and all cheap because it came from America aka Coca-Cola Television. <laughs> They did, however, play a lot of anime in its kids' TV programming slot, launching in 1987, again, dubbed in French, along with popular kids' TV shows from elsewhere, Bucky O'Hare and Snorks. I've got one of these, by the way. However, in late 1987, the channel suffered a decline and the channel would be sold off. In 1990, it got sold to French publisher Hatchet. It tried to change the whole shebang, but it didn't really do a lot. Audience figures were spiralling down further and financially this spiral was becoming one big screw of despair, deepening into the wood until there was no unscrewing. Yep, they were screwed. They declared bankruptcy in January 1992 and it would close in April 1992. The last message from the station reads, La Sank would like to apologise for the permanent loss of picture and sound. It's over. There were a couple of plans to save it. Old Silvio popped his head up and said, I have a plan. Uh, but then it was apparently bopped back down again by the influence of some politicians. There was also a plan for TF1, Canal Plus and M6 to create a new channel to replace the channel to take up the space of a fifth channel so they couldn't come back. This brings us on to our next channel, Arte. <laughs> What in the heck in Lorraine Kelly Metzman Pavlova rocket ship did we just see? Take modern cool, they want their exhibition back. Anyway, Arte launched in 1992 and it was originally established to symbolise Franco-German friendship. There were frequencies left over from Le Sank at the time, so just over a month after it closed, it was home to Arte. France 5 would eventually take the licence that used to belong to Le Sank. The modern version of this logo looks really tasty, like a multi-flavour Campino. This is Sat1, a German channel that launched in January 1984 and it used to have this beach ball type logo. By the way, in many parts of Europe, 
they announced the advert breaks and I'm not sure if this is by choice or due to regulation but they all seem to follow the same format around breaks um, I know they do something similar on Dutch radio they have to play like a tone and make it clear that it's advertising and not part of the show anyway in French they use the word publicity and in German they use the word werbung and that all means advertising. Strangely, on certain days, this was part of four-year-old me's routine. I remember seeing a really showy version of the Wheel of Fortune, which they seem to be really proud of. I mean, have a look. It's called Gluxrad, and it said Werbung at the intro there, so I assume that this is a game show with advertising. Unlike the usual Wheel of Fortune, I think this went out live. Look at that kid wedged in on the end there. It's like, where are we going to put this kid? Ah, let's slap him on end. It's fine. Roll fuck little one. The set looks like the floor manager's gone. Where are we going to put all these prizes? I haven't got any space. And the executive producer's gone. Aye, spread them all over the place. Make it look flashy. I couldn't and still can't talk German, but we used to watch Batman on here and also then watch The Simpsons afterwards on the Sky Channel. That wouldn't mean flicking the tally over. But anyway, it was all connected by dinner. Macaroni cheese. And that has nothing to do with the channel other than a four-year-old me eating macaroni with the phrase, OK, bye, and popping it in my mouth. I would do this macaron by macaron, by the way. Uh, anyway, its broadcasting area is Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Poland, Romania, and Lithuania. And it's a bit like ITV in the shows that it plays. So I mentioned this one a little bit before. Filmnet was a film channel broadcasting mainly to the Scandinavian and Benelux countries along with Poland and Greece. Many of the films were broadcast in English throughout the 80s and 90s, although the films were usually dubbed in different languages. It came about when Swedish video company Esalt Video went into partnership with ATN, a Dutch magazine producer, and United International Pictures. Over the years, it would slowly morph into other things in certain countries. In the Netherlands, it was rebranded as Canal Plus and later changed to Film One and then sold to Sony Pictures in 2015. In Belgium, it also got renamed to Canal One, but is currently known as Playmore. Film that launched in 1995 in Poland, but like the others, it merged into Canal One in 1997. The brand would completely die out, though, in April 2008, when in Greece, the service was renamed to Nova Cinema. RTL Plus was a channel on satellite TV in the 80s and 90s, but it was also known as RTL or RTL Television. The name RTL Plus is now used for their on-demand service. RTL stands for Radio Television Luxembourg, and it started life as a radio station. Radio Luxembourg, nearly over 100 years ago, was airing theatre shows during the Second World War, but it then was taken over by the bad Germans that I can't name, but their boss was a man with a funny tash. Mentioned them before. Anyway, they used it as a propaganda station and it got liberated and then handed back to Luxembourg after the war. Basically, the naughty Germans decided that they were going to use it because Radio Luxembourg's transmitters were really strong, so it had a good footprint across Europe. Radio's my specialism. I could go on about this all day. So to cut a long story short, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, Radio Luxembourg got quite popular and had a bit of a following. They used it as a platform to create a TV station. They launched a number of channels over the 80s, 90s and 2000s and they're responsible for stations across Germany, France and the Benelux region. It's still on air today and it's split up all into different divisions. RTL Deutschland operated free-to-air channels and some pay TV channels such as RTL2. RTL Crime. Crime. Together we'll crack it. RTL Passion 
and RTL Living. Group M6 was their French bass. They run M6 channel. M6 music. W9 and a number of other channels. Their London base is Fremantle and they own all of Thames television stuff after they purchased Thames in 1992 when it closed. RTL Netherlands is based in Hilversum in the Netherlands and it broadcasts channels RTL4 RTL5 RTL 7 Meer voor mannen RTL 8 RTL Z RTL Crime RTL Lounge and Telekids In 1995, they'd launched Super RTL, which was a venture between RTL Group's predecessor and Disney's Buena Vista International. Super RTL, denn Super macht lustig. It played kids' shows during the day and then drama and comedy in the evenings during its primetime hours. A few weeks ago, we told you about a problem that's been happening to ITV idents across the UK since the 1960s, and it's the problem with Yorkshire Television's Chevron. This pest has been attacking logos and disrupting the whole scene. Recently, Channel 4 launched some new logos. However, during the recording of the idents, the Yorkshire Television ident interrupted it and attacked the logo. What you don't see in this video is that backstage, it pecked a man in the leg and it was swearing at everyone. Everyone was sick and also groaning about what happened. It's not cool. In the second Invasion logo for today, the Chevron replaced the Grampian TV logo. This might seem a bit like harmless fun, but a technician was electrocuted in the arm and he snotted himself. This next sequence was found under some chairs at Yorkshire Television Studios where they record Countdown in the mid-80s. It's not really clear as to what's happening, but what is clear is that the logo sees itself as superior and wants others to obey it. Praise the Chevron. No escape. And finally, for today, you can see that we're waiting on a programme to start on BBC One. That's until it's interrupted by the Chevron going round the globe, kicking out the BBC logo and placing itself in the middle of the world. The BBC text that was shoved off the screen mildly scraped a baby. More on the pesky Chevron in a few weeks. Teleclub was one of Europe's first pay TV companies based in Zurich and it was founded in Switzerland in 1982. It was available on cable networks and suffered a lot of pirating in Switzerland to the point that pirates tampered with receiver boxes and cards to receive the channel. Over the years it launched further channels and it was taken over by Swisscom and they rebranded its stations under the Blue brand. big emotions some channels are not destined to work no matter how cool how forward thinking how technologically advanced or how much work goes into it it may have been a good idea on paper and it may have even worked as an experiment but it gets to the point in a project sometimes where you all realize it's just not gonna work that bloody crest that the cat keeps eating the tops off of, or that inner tube that you're pretty sure you've repaired it properly this time round, but then when you go to have a look at it and make sure it's all good, it's gone fucking flat again. We've seen channels come and go, and this one may have been the first, but it certainly wasn't the last.
Europa started in 1985 and it was based in Hilversum in the Netherlands and it broadcast on UTEL Sat's ES1 satellite or the F1 satellite. Now it was pan-European not only in its broadcast area but also in its output. So to overcome language barriers they would air alternative sound outputs that you could pick through your satellite box or if you're watching on cable then they would pick the right version for you and then air it out. Uh, also by subtitles so you can press um, teletext and it would bring you the subtitles up. Now uh, it was one of the first channels to do this in Europe so you could watch it in English, Dutch, German and Portuguese but the thing is the channel closed because the budget they had that was supposed to last them for three years lasted just about a year. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if those needlessly long computer animations were to blame. It was a joint venture between ARD Germany, RTE in Ireland, RAI in Italy, NOS in the Netherlands and RTP in Portugal. It was supposed to rival Sky which had also been doing the same thing for around the same time. This is what happens when you've got more than one boss and they're not willing to take a gamble by flinging cash at it until it works. It closed in November 1986 playing Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush's Don't Give Up. Wait, did we just watch all that and not question who the heck pitched this? Okay guys, so this uh, new channel, Europa, um, so the idea for the graphics basically is have this big triangle with a smaller triangle at the top of the triangle and it moves around and Bob says that we can do it in 3D. Ah, that's great that. Will it last for a painfully long time? You know how I love my lengthy sequences. I've got so much time left I need to spend it doing something. It might as well just be watching a couple of dancing triangles. Well that's brilliant because it gives us time to put a bird in to represent freedom and peace across Europe. Will you make the little triangle do weird stuff so it gets in way of logo? Sure will, but there are a few snags though. Uh, first off, it's 1985, so computers suck ass. And when I say that, I don't mean like today's computers when they actually do suck your ass. Which PC world does that then? The uh, the second little problem we have is that uh, it costs 4,000 guilders a second to make the computer graphics. So we need to make sure we've got the budget for that. Right, well don't worry about that. We can just dip into next year's funds and if we get a little shot, we'll just get everyone to pitch in. What do you think? think carol i think we should get the triangles and the doves to represent freedom in an interpretive dance. dance yeah you always say that you cow <laughs> RAI Uno, or Ray Uno, originally launched in 1954 and its second channel in 1961. It's based in Italy and it's still broadcasting now. It has a selection of channels, RAI 1 to 5, Gulp, based at a teen audience, Publicità. Movie, a film channel, News 24, which is a news channel, Premium, which has reruns of popular shows. Scuola, which is a science channel. Sport. Storia, which is a history channel. Yo-Yo, which is a kids channel, and a couple of other channels as well. Ray is funded via a TV license and advertising, just so you know. Utelsat ECS-1 satellite via France. It was mainly American stuff. Um, not really much that I can find about it other than a little bit in the 1986 Cable Authority annual report and this video. But WorldNet TV and Film Service was an American state-funded cable and satellite channel.
partner a few years ago, Viva was a music channel from Germany and it was intended to rival MTV Europe. It launched in December 1993 and it would broadcast in German but it would eventually be acquired by MTV Networks. And for us in the UK, we would get our own version on satellite, cable and freeview in 2009. On satellite in Europe, it would be joined by Viva Zwei. AKA Viva 2. But Viacom decided to close all the Vivas in 2018. In the UK, just like MTV, it deviated from being a straightforward music channel and started playing TV shows like A Strand Called Noggin, which was a TV block from Nick Jr. It would also play shows like 16 and Pregnant, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, although that's probably easier to say what didn't play that, Teen Mum and Jackass. Cable Eins was a German TV channel originally known as Der Cable Canal in 1992 and it's known for playing American films and TV shows. Its sister stations include Sat1, Pro Saban, Six, Sat1 Emotions, Sat1 Gold, Pro Saban Fun, Pro Saban Max, Cable Eins Classics and Cable Eins Doku. <coughs> MCM is a French music channel which was owned by Group M6 following the same kind of thing that MTV was doing. It started in 1989 and would later become a subscription service so it wouldn't stick around on our screens for too long. I like the idents for this one, especially the Dolphin one. The station isn't part of M6 anymore but it's part of its own group after separating in 2019. Right, that's it for part one. We've got more still to come. But in the meantime, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. My name's Johnny Robinson, and I'll still be Johnny Robinson after this video is finished. Thank you, bye.